Good morning, church. My name is Ronaldo. It is a joy and it's an honor to open up the Word of God with you. I'm going to pray and then we will jump into our time in Acts chapter 21 together. Glorious, omnipotent, sovereign God. Holy Spirit, we present this time together into your hands. We ask that you would do in us individually, but also as a body, Lord, beyond our imagination. In your glorious, holy name I pray. Amen. What is it that makes sense when nothing at all make sense? What can you hang on to? What can you cling to, grasp on to? What can you stand on when it seems like always chaos, when there's nothing to cling on to? Now, I don't, I don't know if this is real or apocryphal. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's fictitious. But I once heard, and again, I I hope I never am actually able to confirm or deny this to you, but I once heard that if you're buried under an avalanche, it can be so disorienting, it can be so traumatic and terrifying and, and, and perplexing and really disorienting that you can actually lose sense of which way is up and which way is in, is down so you can be in danger of of digging yourself out of this avalanche in the wrong direction so i i this is the part that i don't know if it's true and again hope to never find out but I once heard that if you're ever in that situation, what you should do is create a pocket of air in front of your face and then drool. Because even when you cannot make sense of things, even when you cannot trust your own senses, gravity remains a faithful guide. So if you drool, drool will always go down it'll always go towards earth so if you're in that situation and your drool and your drool goes that way well then that way is actually up but what about life what about when life is disorienting what will guide you when life is disorienting Would you read this passage with me? And and we'll see Paul in a very disorienting time. Acts 21, picking up in verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. When they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because the violence of the crowd for the mob of the people followed, crying out away with him. 
As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, and then Acts chapter 22, which we will cover soon, begins Paul's speech. But, but, but uh, stop right there for a moment. What, what kind of passage is this? This is a passage that, that, that you read and, and, and it actually may not make sense when you just look at it. There's, there's no mention of Jesus. There's no mention of God. There's no mention of the gospel. There's no mention of salvation. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit. There's, there's so many biblical things that are not listed in this passage. And what is present is false accusations and, and chaos and a riot and uproar and attempted murder and arrest and, and, and how... How do you make sense of all of this? How do you make sense of such a turbulent, chaotic, catastrophic event in the life of Paul? Well, you've got to go back and you've got to anchor yourself in the words of the king. You've got to anchor yourself. You have, you, you have to find your foundation in the words of Jesus. When he was asked early on in the book of Acts about restoring the kingdom, Jesus said, listen, don't, don't worry about seasons and times and when these things will happen. You, you will be my witnesses. You will testify. You will proclaim to people who it is that I am. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this begins to play itself out just as Jesus foretold, just as he expressed to them, just as he explained to them, this begins to play out sometimes in unpredictable ways. In fact, often in unpredictable ways. And this is, this is one of those. Now, this is just, this is a, this is a disturbing time. What, what, what happened just before this is, is that Paul had heard about the salvation of, of many who were Jewish. And there was the question of whether Paul insisted that Jews not be Jewish. And, and that wasn't the case. And Paul goes out of his way to do certain things to prove that if you're Jewish, you get to remain Jewish, just as the Gentile does not have to become Jewish to come to Christ. Also, the Jewish, the, the Jew does not have to give up their Jewishness to come to Christ. And, 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 and he's doing that. And it had seven days required. And at the end of these seven days, at the end of these seven days, other Jews come from Asia and they see him in the temple. Now, it's interesting that they saw him in the temple and, and, and not in a different location. And we might read that a little bit casually, but I want to take you back and, and, and think about the Old Testament. Right, if you begin to read the Old Testament, if you've read the Old Testament, the temple is actually a, a, a major deal. It's a major component. It's of incredible importance in the Old Testament. And then you start reading the New Testament and you go, where'd it go? What happened to it? What happened to the temple? It was so important at one point, did it just disappear? Did we just go, well, well never mind the temple. I guess we don't need it anymore. Well, what happened to the temple? Well, the answer to our question actually begins in the garden. It all starts in the garden. It starts in the garden, the garden of Eden. 
Now, the Garden of Eden is where God uh, uh, placed man and woman, where he put Adam and Eve right at the beginning, and, and it was perfect perfection in every sense. In fact, uh, when I was a younger man, I once made this argument that the, the Garden of Eden had to have a tree that bore buffalo wings, right? Because there's, there's no death in, in, in the Garden of Eden. There was no dying in the Garden of Eden. There was, there was only life. And you can't have perfection without the presence of buffalo wings. So there had to be a tree that actually bore buffalo wings that you could just pluck them out of them. But, but what I wanna draw your attention to right now is not the perfection of the Garden of Eden, but the fact that in the garden, God met and dwelled unobstructed, uninterrupted with humanity. In fact, Moses, who records the whole thing, tells us that humanity, man and woman, were naked and unashamed. Naked in that all could be seen. Nothing needed to be hidden. Nothing in their lives needed to be suppressed. And there was a perfect absence of shame. When all could be seen about them, they had nothing to be shameful of, and they dwelled with God. But Adam rebelled. Adam committed treason. Adam ruined it all. And when Adam sinned, when Adam disobeyed, the whole thing broke. God's relationship with humanity was severed. It was broken. It was completely disrupted. It was disturbed. It was cut off. And it, it, to such an extent that the garden then became blocked by guardians with flaming swords flashing about so that humanity could not get back into the presence of God. So after that, how can humanity meet with God? Well, God began to meet with humans through a mediator. His name was Moses, and God met with Moses out of a tent. God would operate out of a tent called the tent of meeting, and he would talk to Moses, and Moses would talk to the people. The tent became what was called the tabernacle, and in the days of King David, King David looked around and said, hey, I, I live in this great house. God lives in a tent. I'm going to build God a house. And God goes, David, I'm sorry, did I ask you to build me a house? Did I ask you to build me a house? You're not gonna build me a house. In fact, I'm gonna build you, I'm gonna build you a house. Now, now the that dynasty, that God building David a house, that's something we'll cover on a different day. But God says, You're not gonna build me a house, but your son will. So Solomon goes on and he builds God a house. He builds the temple. And it, is, and it is carefully constructed just as God ordained and inside what was called the Holy of Holies. And it was in that temple that humanity met with God. It was in that temple, in that city, it was in that temple, in the city of Jerusalem, that humanity could meet with God. That's why the temple is so deeply precious to the people of Israel. Now think about this. Here's how John begins his story. John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This one whom John calls the word, he's with God, but he's also God. And then he goes on to say, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God, who is the word, the word who is God, becomes human and dwells with us. Jesus becomes a, Jesus, the God man dwells with us. And then he says this, just one chapter later. 
his, his pupils, his students, his disciples see the temple and they're all impressed with the grandeur and the majesty of this temple and how beautiful it is. And Jesus says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Destroy this temple and in three days, I'll put it back up. You destroy this temple and in three days, I will rebuild it. And he's talking about his resurrection, but don't miss what's happening. Don't miss what's happening because God met with humans in a garden, but then sin came in. And then he had to, to meet with humanity through a, a mediator. And he met with them in a tent. And that tent became a tabernacle. That tabernacle became a temple. And that's where God met with humans. And Jesus said, destroy it. And in three days, I'll build, I'll build it again. In three days, I'll put it back up. And he's talking about himself. Jesus replaces the temple. Jesus replaces where God meets with humanity. Jesus is our access to God. Jesus is that temple. Now, there's a beauty to that. And I want you to relish and delight and revel in that. But there's also an offense that comes with that. You sin, as, as I said, sin cuts us off, severs, breaks our relationship with God. But, it, but in our arrogance, we think we can remedy that situation. We think we can fix it. We think we can right that wrong. But sin and injustice and the wickedness in us is just too vast for a perfectly holy and righteous God. And the gospel attacks our egos and it says, you can't, you cannot get back to God by yourself. You need a mediator. You need a go-between. But that go-between has to be perfect. He has to be big enough to take the fullness of our sins. He has to be infinite to be able to become all of my sins and all of your sins and the sins of the world. He has to be infinite. He has to be God. But it's impossible for God to die. And sin requires death. Sin cannot just be tamed or rerouted. It has to be brought to its end. It has to die. But God, it's impossible for God to die. So God becomes a man. And now that man is infinite and able to become the fullness of our sins, but he is human and he has the ability to die. And so Jesus, the new temple where God meets with humanity, becomes the place, becomes the way that we can be reconciled to God himself. But in those days, they didn't see it that way. And, and those who had not trusted him did not see it that way. And they see Paul in the temple and they, and they come to the conclusion that you are disrespecting the temple. And they cry out, listen, everybody, all of Israel, come and help us, this man. And they accuse him of teaching everybody everywhere against our people, our law, and our place. And he says, listen, he, he even brought somebody that does not belong. He just lets them waltz right into the temple. I remember being at the, I remember being at the Philly Zoo one time. And I've always been enamored with lions. And, and so I was there, I was watching the lion in his cage and, and a zookeeper came to feed him. And after he fed him, the, the, the lion was just walking around and, and the zookeeper's outside the cage. The lion's obviously inside the cage. And when the lion walks by, uh, rubbing his body against the cage, the zookeeper kind of rubs his hand against the lion's body. And I was fascinated by this. I mean, just gripped and captivated by this. 
So I started asking the guy all these questions and he said, yeah, I've known this lion for a long time. I've, I think it was like, it was a long time ago, but he's like, I, I've, you know, been around this lion for seven years. And then I said this, I said, would you ever go inside the cage? And this man erupted into laughter. Like he thought my question was ludicrous and absurd. And he laughed and he said, listen, this lion likes me, but in playing with me, he would crush me to my death. And I think sometimes we think we can just waltz into the presence of God and we forget that he is perfectly holy. Injustice and wickedness cannot touch him. It'll be consumed. And that's what we have. That's why we can only come to God through a mediator. It has to be Jesus. But they didn't see it that way. And they said, listen, Paul is just letting people in here and he's teaching all of these things and, and they're making all of these false accusations about Paul. And, and with that, he ends up getting dragged out and pulled and he's being beaten and smashed. They're bloodthirsty. They want to end his life. And the only way that it stops, earthly speaking, speaking from a human point of view, we can see the hand of God over it, but from a human point of view, it goes up the chain in, in Roman leadership and, and the Roman leader comes in, the tribune comes in and, and, and he stops the whole thing from happening. It takes at least, at least two centurions. A centurion would be a soldier that was in charge of a hundred soldiers. So it's at least, at least minimally, minimally 200 people to stop this, this mob from destroying Paul's life. And then there's this interaction about who he is and Paul begins to, to explain who it is that he is again before he goes into this speech in, in Acts chapter 22. But let me give you a preview of what is happening here and then what happens on from here. Paul is here arrested at the temple. He's gonna go on to be imprisoned right here in Jerusalem. After that, he's going to get transferred over to Caesarea. He'll have a trial there. He'll be imprisoned there before he makes his way to Rome. And at points, this seems chaotic and confusing, and it seems like it makes no sense. But then you remember, Paul was warned by this. Excuse me. Paul was warned about this. And he said, not only am I willing to be bound, I'm willing to die for the sake of Jesus. I want you to see how costly the gospel is. I want you to see, I want you to look at what Paul endured so that others could hear the gospel. Now you might be thinking, hey, that's great. I'm glad they got to hear the gospel, but what's that got to do with me? I live in America. The gospel can just come to me and it can go from me whenever I want. There's no cost. Well, there actually has been a cost. In fact, the, the gospel to, 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 to reach the English speaking world came at a very high cost. The Bible, uh, originally written in, in Hebrew and then Greek, at the time was translated into Latin, and it was forbidden that it would be translated into English. And a guy by the name of John Wycliffe was the first one to translate it into English. He, he took the language of the day, which was Latin, and then he translated that into English, and it became the first Bible in the English language. They were so angry with him. They were so livid that after he had died, they disinterred him. They unburied, they excavated, they pulled out his body and burned it. 
They burned his corpse and it became illegal. It became illegal to translate the Bible into English or to have an unauthorized copy in your hands, an unlicensed copy in your hands. And then a man named William Tyndale who wanted you, who wanted you to have the Bible in your very own language, who wanted you to be able to read and bask in the light in the words of God. But that made him, because that was his desire, he was labeled a heretic and was strangled and burned. That's the bloody cost of the gospel coming into the language that you and I communicate with today. I want to say that so you delight in that and see the love of God for you in wanting to make his good nose known in a manner that your years would understand. I want you to delight in the love that others had for you hundreds of years before you were born to make the gospel known to you in your language. And as you and I begin to think about what the gospel will cost us, it's beautiful to know that we stand where we stand because the cost that others were willing to pay we look at this scene, we look at this situation, the brutality that Paul begins to endure, the attempted murder in his life, the chaos, the screaming, the confusion. And if we just microscope into this and we lose sight of the panoramic, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. So we have to go back and ask ourselves, what is it that makes sense when nothing makes sense? And this begins to make sense because the gospel makes sense. God became a human who made himself known to us, who died in our place. And and the risen Nazarene, the resurrected carpenter, is the ruling king. And in the gospel, we see the love and the mercy of God, the forgiveness of sins. The gospel still makes sense. There's a ruling king who will make all things good. But you know, the same is also true about your life. If you microscope in and lose sight of the panoramic, it makes no sense. There will be times of chaos. There will be times of turbulence. There will be times where life makes no sense. And what is it that makes sense when nothing in your sense, in your life makes sense? And I appeal to you that the gospel makes sense. The gospel makes sense that God loves you. That God is so enamored and he delights in you. He is head over heels in love with you. That even though you and I were sinners, Christ died to forgive us of our sins. But he makes this promise. Paul delivers that promise to us. He says that God will work all things. He will take everything in your life and make it somehow in ways that, that, that baffle our wildest imaginations, that everything that happens in our lives, God will work out for the highest good of those who love him, of those who trust him, of those who have been rescued by him. It may not make sense at the moment. 
It may not make sense at the exact moment, but we look back to the death of Christ that rescues us. We look forward to the return of our king to bring us into his kingdom. And we anchor ourselves with the presence and the light of the Holy Spirit in our lives who will carry, who will sustain, who will uphold us, who will, who, who will make himself more known to us through his word when life makes no sense. Will you pray with me? Glorious God, holy and righteous and beautiful, God, sometimes our lives just don't make any sense. And we cling to the truth, the beauty, and the goodness of your gospel. We entrust our lives uniquely, individually into your hands. We entrust our life as a church into your hands. In your holy name, amen. Thank you. Pastor Ronaldo, for that amazing uh, word uh, on this week. I pray that uh, you would all take the sermon challenge this week and allow it to be manifested in your lives so others uh, come to know Jesus. Uh, you know, we teach here at You Flourish Church that uh, we don't just want to have head knowledge, but we want to live out our faith in ways that will impact the spaces and places that we occupy. Uh, now that you had an opportunity to uh, participate in the ministry of the word, I pray that you would join me in the ministry of giving. Uh, here at You Flourish Church, we have two ways that you can give. And uh, one is uh, you can text uh, the dollar amount uh, you want to give to the number 84321. Or you can go to our website at Helping You Flourish. Uh, dot org and you could make uh, a donation there. Uh, do remember that there's no gift uh, too small and we don't want you to feel guilted in giving, but uh, we do believe that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Thank you so much for your giving and may God bless you.